Yeah, thanks, Mary Frances, and good morning, everybody. Uh, just to thank the team first. Uh, you guys did all the compiling of the inventory and you did the slides and you wrote the report, so uh, well done to everybody. Um, so really, I'm just going to go through five sectors if I have time. Mary Frances, you let me know if I'm running out of time. Obviously, the three biggest sectors, uh, well, four, the five biggest sectors when you, when you look at them together. Uh, the, the first three sectors account for about 74% of emissions. This is the long-term trend, and uh, Stephen has already shown this, as emissions are, uh, are still, um, they're still uh, above uh, the 1990 baseline of by 9%. Uh, I won't go into this, Stephen has shown these already, but this is the per capita emissions. Um, you can see per capita emissions now in, in 2022 are down to 11.9 tonnes per person, down from 12.4 tonnes per person last year. And you can see over the time period, the 33 years, the population has increased by 46%. And it's worth noting that the population is forecast to go up to 6 million. So, you know, an extra million people at even 10, 10 tonnes per person is another 10 million tonnes per annum. So we need to lower this per capita emissions. And that's just as how we, we, we fare against the rest of the EU. This is 2021 data, by the way. And you can see what's really uh, impactful is our methane share, three and a half tonnes per person. And the nearest member state for methane would be Denmark, and that's about 1.5 tonnes per person. Uh, so this is the impact for agricultural emissions, of course. So if we move on to agriculture now, we can see the long term trend in agriculture. Methane emissions are up 19.5% over the 33 years, and the share of methane emissions have increased from 68% to 71%. Uh, nitrous oxide emissions are down 1.1%. And uh, CO2 emissions are up 16.6% over the time period. So th this is one of the main drivers in agriculture, particularly in the last 10 years, and it's th the number of dairy cattle in the country and the corresponding milk production. So you can see, you know, in 2010 we had about 1.1 million dairy cattle, and now we have 1.6 million, 1.5a, I think it is. But the yield per, per cattle is actually up. Milk yield is up 42% since 1990, and um, it's 16% higher even over the last 10 years. So you can see where dairy cattle is 17% now above the 1990 level, but uh, as I said already, it's 51% above the 2010 level, and other cattle are 4.5% higher uh, since 1990 also. And other cattle are a bigger share, like they've 5.7 million animals in 2022. So this is the emissions from a dairy cow, uh, just the methane emissions uh, from enteric fermentation and manure management. And you can see in 1990, it was 114 kilos of methane per cow, and now it's 135 kilos per, uh, per cow. And that's an 18% increase. And just the equivalency of that, that's 3.8 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per dairy cattle, which is higher than the heating for a house, and it's higher than the emissions from a, a diesel car. So this looking at the fertiliser and urea use, and this is the big change. There was a big jump in urea use last year, 30%. And this is the 14% decrease in, in fertiliser that Stephen spoke about. And some of this may have been down to higher prices. So fertilizer numbers are 343,000 tons now, down from 399,000 tons of nitrogen in 2021. So that's a 56% drop. And we have to get down to 300,000 by 2030 or 325,000 by 2025. But interestingly enough, it, there was a big increase in urea last year, both straight urea, which went up 30%, and and inhibited urea, which went up 52%. Now, just to say between between the two of them, this is good. Stabilized urea reduces the amount of emissions per tonne for nitrous oxide and ammonia, but straight urea is, is bad for both N2O and ammonia. So what we want to see is more straight urea, or more stabilized urea and less uh, uh, straight urea. 
So we'll move on to transport. Stephen has shown this, but this is just the full time series. You can see the growth over the, the 1990s. Uh, like we'd, at one, one stage, we had 17% and 16% growth in transport emissions each year. But um, COVID is, is highlighted here, the 15.5% reduction. And now we've had two years of, you know, quite large increases, you know, relative to what we've seen in the past, six and a half percent and six percent in the last two years. Um, EVs, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. This is the fuel use from, from cars and, and, and the, 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 the fleet, the car fleet. We see the petrol is beginning to rebound, so it's 29 petajoules um, with a 14 percent this year. Uh, diesel is still going up about four and a half, five percent. Uh, it's still a bigger share, but uh, biofuels saved about 0.56 million tons in 2022. It's still a small share, but but biofuel obligation has changed now in 2023. The the blending rate is higher, so we might see a bigger impact with the 2023 numbers. Uh, this is the car fleet, and you can really see here in 2007 where well, we went to the banding on CO2 emissions. Everybody bought diesel cars and we stopped buying petrol cars. But that's somewhat reversed in the last couple of years. Petrol cars are on the up again. Uh, I suppose this is the plug in hybrids. A lot of them would be electric and hybrids. Uh, um, so these, and, and we actually saw the first decrease in the diesel car fleet. So this is borne out by the annual sales of new vehicles. You can see diesel is kind of gone out of fashion. But just to put in context, if we got rid of all the petrol cars tomorrow, that would save us 2 million tonnes of emissions. And if we got rid of all the diesel cars, that would be about 3.7 million tonnes. So the two of them together is about 5.8 million tonnes of CO2 annually. The electric vehicle fleet, we can see we're slightly ahead of where we, we should be in the cap 23, uh, a little bit less fully electric than, than the planned and a little bit more uh, plug-in hybrids. Uh, but we're, we're on track, we're ahead of target. We have to get to uh, 195,000 electric vehicles by 2025 and nine, 950,000 vehicles by 2030. But it can be done. This is the EU in 2021. This is where we fit in. So that's our electric and, and plug-in hybrids in 2021. That's the share of sales of new vehicles in the year. And you can see some countries have managed to have 86% uh, share as Norway. Uh, we have uh, Sweden with 46% share and Denmark with a 35% share. Now these are similar high GDP countries and I think we're just lagging a couple of years behind these because I've actually seen 2022 data for Denmark and they've actually switched entirely from you know this share of BEVs and, and plug-in hybrids to a much greater share of just BEVs. Uh, you know, it's up around 80% now. That might have been a policy shift to, to stop incentivizing plug-in hybrids. And you can see that across a lot of member states. But three countries are responsible for, you know, 63% of total sales annually. That would be Germany, France and Norway. So you can see there's about 700,000 vehicles came online in Germany in 2021. So this is just international aviation. This is not in our national total, but it's worth noting that's 3 million tonnes of emissions in 2022. And anyone that's used the airport recently, last year or this year will know it's business as usual. We're kind of back to where we were pre-COVID and I'm sure 2023 will be no different. So a lot of this uh, aviation, about half of this 3 million tonnes is in the ETS. So that would be the flights between Ireland and EU member states. So the stuff that goes to transatlantic or to the Middle East or whatever, that's not in ETS, that's outside the scope. So energy industry, Stephen showed that already. We'll just show, well, what's going on in the energy industries? Well, you can see here in 2022, 48.8% of, of the electricity came from gas and almost 39% from renewables. And it's it's worth noting that we didn't import as much electricity as last year. And just that importing of electricity saved us half a million tons last year. So we had to make that electricity ourselves. But that shows the importance of interconnection. Like the more interconnection, you know, the, the easier it is to get low, low carbon intensity electricity uh, when it's available. Um, 
So coal, oil and peat together generate only 11% of our electricity requirements. So how do we fare in intensity? We're, we're down to 331 grams per kilowatt hours generated, down from 348. We had an all time low in 2020, but that was a very low coal and high wind year. And what does that look like in terms of the EU? EEA have a nice indicator. Here's the link. Uh, it shows 1990 out to 2021. So Ireland is ranked here based on the last year. And you can see we're 10 countries above the EU average for electricity intensity. Now, if you look at the bottom four, Cyprus, Estonia, Bulgaria and Poland, they, they burn mainly solid fuels. They've no nuclear and they've very little renewables. And then you can you can note there's, there's five, six other member states, including us that are below the average. The EU average is 238 grams per kilowatt hour and we're at 330. So we're still 100 above. Uh, and why is that? I suppose it's this really, uh, it's the share of solid fuel still in our electricity generation. If you look at the last three years, like coal and peat produce five, nine and eight percent of our electricity, but produce 22, 31 and 26 percent of emissions. So a quarter of the emissions for eight percent of the electricity is not really a good return. So we really need to decarbonize. Uh, and uh, I believe the, the peat plant should be offline for peat, I think, by the end of this year. But we, we still have money point. So the residential, Stephen has shown that uh, already, so I'll just skip on to the drivers. Over the time period, you can see emissions per household went from seven and a half tonnes per house when we had about a million houses, and now we've 1.8 million houses, and emissions are at an all-time low of 3.3 tonnes per house. And this is on the back of the very high prices that Stephen mentioned already. Uh, and I think people got the message, if, you, if, if you're paying a lot for your fuel, you might turn down the boiler by a couple of degrees. Uh, just to put in context about retrofits, I mean, since 2015, there's been 170,000 properties retrofitted from 15 to 2022. There's been over 500 million spent on that. And, um, you know, it's still up to 2022. I think there were about 21,000 houses achieved a B or B2 or better after the retrofit. So it's still, it's still not enough. But uh, if you look at the, the weather is another big effect. This is the average uh, over the last eight years, the heating curve. You can see the winter seasons we need, that's more degree days. And 2021 was, was, wasn't, was a mild year as well. But this year is 2022. You can see only December was, was required more heating than the previous year. The red line is broadly below average. And, uh, it, it helps that we, we don't have to have uh, the heating on as much. Uh, manufacturing combustion industries, this is good news this year. I mean, it went down 7.1% or 0.33 million tonnes. And when it was across the board, and I suppose it was energy prices playing, uh, playing a, a role here. Uh, we see in reductions in non-ferrous metals, chemicals, and the beverages and tobacco sector, and non-metallic metallic minerals. That includes cement, so that would be this band here. Um, and within the ETS, um, this is industry only in ETS. You can see the recession here in 09, and the large drop in cement reduction, 38% year on year. And that's really when it went from boom bust. And you can see the recovery in the cement sector over time. But now we see last year dropped uh, by 9%. And I suppose prices must have played an impact on that too, because uh, I mean, I suppose that's been played out now in, in Navin this week with the tower mines. You can see uh, energy costs has really have an effect on some of these energy intensive industries. This is our process emissions now from, from the uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, this, this area here, you would, that would be our chemical industry back in 1990, 2001. So the ammonia plant in Cork and the nitrous, nitric acid plant in Arclo, they would have been producing fertilizer. That's gone now. So really mineral products is, is, is the cause of emissions. And that's the cement, lime, bricks and cer ceramic use, uh, et cetera. Uh, so you can see 90% of that comes from uh, 
bricks and ceramics and cement and iron. And this is ETS overall. This is actually good news because um, like ETS has reduced by 35% over the last 18 years. I mean, ESR emissions have only reduced by uh, 5%, I think. So like, I mean, this is the heavy lifting in the economy for keeping emissions uh, curtailed. And within that, power gen emissions have gone down 41%. And um, cement sector emissions have gone down by a million tons or 25% since uh, 2005. So I'm going to leave it there. That's all the information on the website. Um, uh, you, like, you can download the report and all of the Excel files, including the, the, uh, the climate action plan and the sector of ceiling budgets. And, um, the slides will be up there later. So thank you.